Hello out there. Welcome to your next mission video podcast. We have a, a terrific show today that focuses on transitioning from the military. CSM retired Michael Quinn, a leader in the transition field, joins us with some insights and tips you won't find anywhere else on how to make that transition a successful one. Whether you're transitioning now or later, you need to hear this one. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome to Your Next Mission video podcast, where we tell the stories of those who have served in the past and those who are serving today. From transition to financial wellness, VA benefits to mental health, we cover issues facing veterans, active military, and their families. Now here's your host, the 12th Sergeant Major of the Army and co-founder of the American Freedom Foundation, Jack L. Tilley. Hello out there, warriors, past and present, your families, and thank you for your service to our great country. Now, before we get started, I personally want to thank our presenting sponsors, Navy Federal Credit Union, Purdue Global, and USAA for, for making your next mission happen. They love our veterans and families, and I'm always going to say this every week, we love them too. As I said earlier, we have a, a terrific show focusing on transitioning from the military and I'm so excited, because he's a Sergeant Major now, I'm so excited to introduce CSM retired Michael Quinn, CEO of Tenova LLC and Higher Military, and a two-time top LinkedIn voice. Welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you, SMA. It's it's an honor. I'm, I always enjoy having these conversations with you. Well, I appreciate it. Hey, I know our audience wants to hear all about the stuff you're doing, and I, I want to start off right now saying thanks a lot for what you're doing. You're making a difference in... Uh, and together we all can make a big difference. And we're just going to keep pushing. You push, I push, and a lot of other people are pushing out there. So we appreciate it. Hey, tell us about yourself. Take a, you know, don't take a couple hours. Take a couple minutes and <laughs> tell me a little yeah, bit about no, yourself. No problem, SMA. So uh, retired Army Sergeant Major. I, I actually retired in November of 2017 after 24 years, three months, and three days. And I, I certainly wasn't counting. They told me in my DD-214. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean, I was planning on doing 30 years. I loved the army. Um, and the list of assignments came down and my former spouse said, I'm not moving. And so I went from having seven years left to having a year left. I dropped my retirement packet and uh, everyone told me you're going to be fine. I was, I was a high performer my entire career. First promoted the entire way, you know, getting the best assignments. I was the operations star major for intelligence security command here in the DC area. And, and, I really just thought that I was set based on what people said. And I did what they told us in TAP, and I went to my first job fair, and I spent six hours talking to 41 employers. And I literally watched them take a look at my resume, circle my clearance, and throw it on a pile of paper and say, check our careers page and apply online. And it was an absolute gut punch. And it was what ended up being the hardest year of my life. You know, harder than Iraq, Afghanistan, Bosnia, Kuwait, Philippines, like, Harder than any deployment, any job because of the the unknown, the day on the calendar where I did not have a job. The unknown is the what I was going to do after that day. Was I going to love it like I love the Army? And, and was I going to find a career that allowed me to take care of my family? And so thankfully, one of those recruiters told me to connect with them on LinkedIn, and it, and it opened the world for me. Uh, gave me access to mentors, gave me information about industry. I was able to do all my intel stuff and figure out what I needed to do to make myself a best candidate, how to choose the best job. And, and it worked. I went to a small business as a director for my first year. I went to Ernst & Young uh, as an executive my second year and third year. And then I realized that I wanted to start my own business. I wanted to do things my way. And I realized that I, I had something I can give back. And so I started our military, which turned into Tenova, which is our actual business. And um, really, we just focus on, you know, as a service table veteran-owned small business, we do government staffing. Uh, we do staffing for the private sector, SkillBridge, you know, just finding ways to provide value and still support our community. So yeah, yeah. Um, super exciting. Well, you, you know, you hit a lot of really great things there. You know, I, we had somebody out of Mass Sergeant Wilson on the show from Soldier for Life here not too long ago, and she talked about the fact that she called it, and I've never heard it called this, but she called it the deadly gap, which is that one year, two years, or three years when you get out of the service. And maybe we can talk about that a little bit later, because I think we and you hit on it too. There's a culture shock when you get out, 
Where do you fit in? Where do you find your tribe? Where do you do all those things? So it, it's really important. And I and we talked about it just a few minutes ago. I wish there was a way for us to uh, start that educational process, process just a little bit earlier before you come into service. Hey, your business has so many different things they're, they're doing to help veterans you know, get hired. Why do you make transition from the military? And you just said it anyway, but this is a great question. What's such a, a tremendous focus? You know, what's that? Yeah, uh, why? I, why? You know, I it was the hardest year of my life. Uh, I, I genuinely believe it it played a role in my divorce. Yeah. You know, it impacted my mental health, my physical health, you know, uh, trying to, to do my job and prepare for my transition all in that last year without the support that I believe needed to be out there or that I knew was out there or that I didn't know where to reach out. So I had to do experiential learning for everything. I had to make so many mistakes to be able to find the right way to do things. And ultimately, I'm a retired sergeant major. You know, my career was about, you know, helping to lead, helping to mentor people and coach people. And so when I realized that I had this struggle and I started teaching others, you know, I was able to fill a gap and provide this advice and assistance. And and you can't, there's a couple of big things about the transition. I don't think many people realize is like you said, the gap year or whatever. I mean, the transition absolutely plays a role in suicides, right? You lose your family, you lose your culture, you lose your purpose. And if you don't find that and you feel like you're alone, it's there. Um, I I will say that the transition plays a role in our recruiting issues. The best transitioning service member or the best recruiter is a well-transitioned service member, but every service member that gets out with a bad experience, no one in their family will ever join. Well, the big the big thing is 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 just the fact that you're fitting in and you don't if you, mm-hmm. you, you, you I really I gotta tell you my story a little real quick here, is that I got out and I thought, man, I I can live anywhere. This isn't a problem. This yeah. is I didn't really think about it. So I moved in and, and I've told this story a bunch of times. I moved in, we build a house, I'm all excited about the house. When I moved into my house, I started walking around, shaking hands and be, hey, how you doing? I'm Jack Day. I was in a, you know, and my wife says, these guys are going to think you're nuts. You know, don't, don't bother. You know, leave them alone. Yeah. That's what do you mean? No, I, you know, so, so it took me a while to make that adjust. I'm going to take, I got to be honest with you. I don't know if I've ever really fully adjusted. The, be, <laughs> the, be, the best time I have though, is when I talk to somebody from the military. Yeah. You know, because they because yeah. they understand what I'm talking about. And it's really it's really important. Hey, do you run across service members who think the government, uh, you know, TAP transition assistance program? Why do we need anything else to, to get ready for transition? People that say TAPS is enough, I guess. I, I think the only people that say that are current leaders in the military. Yeah. I don't know a single veteran that would say TAP is enough. Yeah. And, and we got to understand TAP is the congressionally mandated program minimum standards like this is what we have to provide you to get you the basic skills to find employment it's not all the informational interviews it's not all the extra resources it's not i mean it it doesn't drill down in enough detail and maybe it does but it's still you know you're drinking from a fire hose but it doesn't give you enough detail over time and it's not able to go back in and get it it's just really hard to take everything you need to find your next career in basically three to five days. And I want to add one other thing, SMA, is that your transition, and you just said this, your transition does not end when you get a job. It's way more than finding a job. I mean, 50% leave their first post-military job within a year, 78% leave it within 18 months. They're not bad. Some are promotions, but I mean, it's just, it's the transition is life. Right. There's there's going to be career transitions. There's going to be opportunities. There's going to be family. And so I think the most important for us is that, you know, we still have our community. We never feel isolated uh, and that we have people that we can lean on. And I'll tell you, there's no community that's better at that than the veteran community. No, I agree. Well, the other thing is when you get into a job, you got to fit in. You know, you can have, you can make all the money in the world, but if you don't fit in in that job, oh my, oh my gosh, you're you're not, you know, it doesn't mean anything. You know, yeah. I used to, in fact, I had a good friend of mine. I won't, I won't mention his name on the area, but, but I had a good friend of mine. I found him one job for, uh, oh, I don't know, a, a good, you know, it's a good paying job. And the other one was like $30,000 more. And I called him up and I said, Hey, look, I know you've already committed to this one, but I have a better job for you. You know what he told me? He said, Sergeant Major, I've already committed to this one. And that, and that's the kind, you know, and I thought that was great of him because, uh, you know, he, he's, he was just a loyal guy that wanted to do the best job he could. And he, and he wasn't worried about money. He was worried about, uh, 
you know, about doing doing the right job for that company. And the other thing he's, he's worried about is, is I've given my word. I don't I don't think most people understand the fact that you know if a veteran gives his word, he's gonna he's gonna live by his word. Now I don't know if I could have did that, but uh, I guess he did. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think so. What I would say is the company committed to him. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So there's two sides to every equation out here. You know, it's not always the greater good now. I mean, uh, people have to realize that companies need revenue. They need money to be able to operate and pay salaries. You don't get it from Congress anymore. And so if there's an economic downturn, if there if companies lose a contract, if there's a big significant impact on that bottom line, the company may have to make hard decisions like that. And and so what I tell everyone is, you, you know, you have to evaluate you know, your word and your commitment, but by the same token, you know, you have to make the best decision for you and your family Absolutely. It's beyond salary, yep. but you have to analyze it. And there's nothing wrong with going back to the company and saying, Hey, I have this other offer, you know, it's 30,000 more. It's a similar job and responsibility. You know, uh, it's hard for me to say no to that kind of money. Can you, can you, can you make up some of the difference or can you match it? You know, and that's not something we learn. And it's not certainly what you get the experience in doing that after a couple hours in tap. Yeah, yeah. Well, the other thing I'll tell you, too, is that when I, I, I never really, well, I guess I did do that. But you got medical care and a lot of other, you know, benefits. And uh, when people so want to say, uh, well, when I was talking to the employer, I said, hey, look, I have medical care. So that should be some additional money because I'm not going to use your medical care. And I think that's important. And that could be, yeah, they may or may I not. I mean, it depends. Right. Yeah, it depends. Right? Certainly so, does. Yeah. So we have our employer portion as a small business. So, you know, there's a little bit of cost savings if you don't take our, our health care plan. But for a lot of large employees, they're not even willing to consider it because they buy everything in bulk. So it just, it, but these are all open and honest conversations between you, the recruiter, the employer, so that everybody's on the same page. I, I, I did a post about salary negotiation uh, last week, I think, and it was really just talking to people. It's not a, it's not a win, right? It's not, it's not a win situation. If the employer walks away saying, "I win, I got them cheaper," and if the if the employee walks away saying, "I won, I got them to pay more money," then you, you both lost, right? <laughs> it's about finding the right balance, right? Having open and honest conversations because it's got to be long term employment. If you leave within a year, the company lost money. Yeah. If yeah. you show up and you find out the people down the hall are making twenty k more than you in a year, you're going to be upset. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's got to be. It's not a used car sales. It's got to be open, honest communication based on facts. Yeah, we're going to talk about it in just a couple of minutes about how much are you really worth. I'm going to get to that in just a couple. But I have a couple more questions here before that. Hey, we we can get to specifics later. But generally speaking, if if tap isn't enough, where does a veteran go? I mean, we're, we're saying tap may have not have all that information. Uh, where where do they go? Who do they talk to? Yeah, I, so. So let's talk about TAP first. When we talk about the transition assistance program, you know, that's the congressionally mandated pieces. And so you have your, your checklist of things you have to do. You've got your basic one day VA. You've got your three total days with the Department of Labor vets, and you've got your one service related day, right? And so that goes through everything. What I will say is that every installation has transition centers of some kind, right? And so what I'll tell people is you can't just do the mandatory portion of TAP and say, I'm, I'm good. So I would say, go down to your transition centers, right? Go walk in and say, what other resources do you have? Can I get some counseling? Can I get some support? Do you have additional classes that you can take? You can go to American job centers and see what resources they have. They're community-based run by the Department of Labor that will provide you additional support. You can go to the USO USO Pathfinders, they'll give you one person that will work with you and give you access to all the resources. You can go to American Corporate Partners and get a mentor from a Fortune 500 company from a year. Hire Here's USA will provide you uh, somebody to help you with the resume, get informational interviews. And then uh, Onward to Opportunity will get you a certification and the training to get it. So, I mean, like, and that's just like a snapshot of all of this. Like, there's so, there's so many nonprofit, community-based organizations that are, that are going to provide you the assistance you need. They're not all going to work equally for everybody, but I say sign up for all of them and stick for the ones that work best for you. And, and But it's a, it's a it takes a person walking into somewhere or asking for help or asking for resources to be able to get them. Uh, you know, I, I, you, you bring up some great points. One, one thing I think is uh, there's too much information out there. 
there has to, you sort of got to shrink it down a little bit. I mean, there's a lot of people that are helpful doing a lot of stuff, but let's fine tune it just a little bit. The second thing is, is a spouse. How much involvement should the spouse have? I think, I mean, arm in arm, when I walk into that tap class, I'm poof, she should be right with me. But, yeah. but that's really, I guess, I guess a space available. There may not be room for her to come in there. Uh, no, no. Spouses are always welcome. Yeah. I, I just heard yesterday, I was at Congress yesterday talking tap innovation. And one of the spouses that runs one of the, I think it was Blue Star Families. I'm not 100% sure. She said that Fort Liberty did the most amazing thing is in the back of the classroom, they put a bunch of toys and they brought in somebody to watch kids so the spouse could attend. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Right? So yeah. the right. And then they also had classes after hours. Yeah. So that they come. So like you've got to work around that. But I mean, let's talk about spouses. Spouses are the most economically disadvantaged group in the United States. I think right now they're at 21 percent unemployment. Oh, wow. And that's not counting underemployment, master's degrees, bagging yeah. groceries overseas. Yeah. yeah. Right. I, I mean, it's horrible. So what you have in a spouse, though, is someone that certainly knows the job seeking process in most situations, like boing, 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 boing every three years, four years. They're looking for jobs. So, you know, some of the most knowledgeable people on the transition I come into are spouses. You know, my director of talent acquisition, a spouse, my senior recruiting manager, spouse. So I think we really need to, to lean on them. And you also need to involve your spouse in these decisions on where you're going to go and what you're going to do uh, for your family to continue past getting out. Well, I, I, I tell you that I've been married a long time and I don't make any decisions uh, unless my wife is there with me. In fact, one day I, I told my wife, I said, you know, I don't, I don't make any decisions. She says, well, you make all the big decisions. I said, well, yeah. And she said, well, but none of them's ever come up. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> but, 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 but the point is that that it has to be a joint decision. I mean, I'm not going to make any decision without my wife involved. In fact, and she does the same thing. She's going to spend something or do something or whatever, and, and she thinks there's a little more money she should be spending. She'll come and say, just to let you know. Now, I'm not going to say no, but but it, you got to have that dialogue with it, uh, with her. And uh, and but luckily we we got a good uh, good relationship. The good, the good thing is, I realized I don't know when it was, but I realized that I wasn't in charge very quickly in our marriage. The other thing is, is because, you know, I stayed in the army a long time. She's with me all the way, other mm -hmm. than about three years in the middle, first three years. So she stayed with about 32 uh, plus years in the military. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, and so she ran the, she ran the household. She made all yeah. the decisions. I was always gone doing stuff and, you know, and, and she made all those decisions. So I think it's, in, it's important then when you get out of the military to, uh, and not just when you get out of the military, yeah. but always keep them involved. Hey, do you think veteran community guys like you know, like me and you, older guys here, get used enough? You know, when it comes to resources and transition with service members, I, me personally, now I'll say it before I ask that before you answer the question. I don't think they do, uh, because I think there's like I always have different numbers, like 17 million veterans out there, and we should be yeah. involved in a sponsorship a little bit more with helping people get out of service. Your yeah. thoughts on that? Well, I like that you use the word sponsorship and not mentors, yeah. right? So I, I will say that it is impossible for us to figure out our next career, do the research, make choice, educated choices on what you want to do, where you want to go, how much you're worth, all that stuff from the internet. And you can't ask your leaders in the military because they don't know either, unless you're lucky enough to have some reserve component people in your organization and you can lean the heck on them because they've been there. They've done it. They're hidden gems when it comes to transition. But, you know, when it comes to choosing what you want to do next and, and making the right choices and negotiating and everything else like that, that you've never had to do, you know, the best people to help you are veterans that have been where you want to go. Right. I mean, that's the key. So you need to ultimately uh, figure out what you want to do, where you want to go. And then you need to build almost like a board of directors. You need to find a group of veterans that have been where you want to go at the level you want to reach that can advise you on how to translate, on how to explain, that can open doors for you, and, and that can create opportunity. And that's why I say sponsor, because mentors, like, answer questions, advise, but you really want a group of people that are going to be, they're going to see an opportunity, they're going to introduce you to their network, they're going to do all these things proactively on your behalf. You need a few of those to really make it work. Yeah, I, th I think the other thing, though, is how many do you have? I always say mm -hmm. you three or four, whatever you feel yeah. comfortable with. 
Uh, yeah, I, I think that's it's so important. I mean, I called, I can't remember, I called a bunch of people, especially when the first job I was ever going to get, I called two or three and say, look, here's what the guy was talking about and the job was talking about. What do you think about this? Would you take a look at my resume? Would you take a look mm -hmm. at this? So he needs somebody yep. to sort of guide you in that way. This is yep. a great discussion. And so don't you go anywhere. <laughs> we got to take a quick break. I'll be right back. <laughs> We're talking with Michael Quinn, CEO of Tenova LLC and Higher Military. And you're watching your next mission video podcast with me, your host, Jack L. Tilly, 12th Sergeant Major of the Army. And don't forget, if you're enjoying this discussion, and you've got to be if you're a veteran because we're talking about your issues, please like us. Click on that subscribe button below. Also, click on the bell next to the subscribe button to receive notifications of all of our upcoming video podcasts. Michael, Mike, I'm not going to call you Michael. Uh, Sergeant Mike. Major, I guess you, I'm not going to call you either one. I'm going to call you Sergeant Major. When you, <laughs> when you're in the military, you know how much uh, you're going to make. Uh, you know, we talked about that. But you know how much you're going to make in the military. All that. How, how do you sort of work through that when you're in the civilian sector? I mean, how do you figure out? I mean, I had a problem with that. I got to tell you this: story. how much are you worth? When right. I when I went to the transition office. And I, and I came, I went over there, I sat for an hour, and I said, this is not for me. So I went back to my office and called over there, say, look, send the best guy who's ever given these classes over my office. And when he came to the yeah. office, he says, uh, he says, uh, Sergeant Major, what do you want? I said, well, first of all, I, I need to know what I need to get out of the service. And the first question I have is, uh, and, what, what, and I asked him about resumes and stuff. And then he looked at me and he says, Sergeant Major, how much do you think you're worth? And I said, well, I think I'm worth about, I don't know, 50000 or something like that? Or do you think that's enough? Because I had no thought and idea about right. it in the civilian sector. So so how do you figure that out? I mean, how do you figure out how much you're worth? Yep. So I, I, I hate to say this. I think it's a bad question. It is a bad, okay. Right? Because what are you worth is based off of what you're doing right now. Right? Oh, okay. So I would say what you're worth is whatever job you were in. So as the SMA, you had a pay chart and you had your BAH, a BAQ and all that other stuff. And the problem is, is that a lot of us look backwards when we determine our worth. Like, this is what I've done. This is what I do. When the reality is you are worth a salary band that's aligned specifically to that role where you're going. So in order to figure out what you're, what you're worth or really what your salary requirements are, which is really not what do you need to make, it's not factoring in your retirement or disability, it's how much do I have to pay you to do this job and be happy about doing it? Like that's the, that's the question. That's the, what are your salary requirements? And to do that, you have to understand that. I mean, there's a huge range, right? They, you know, location, size of company, industry type of role, you know, is it, is it a cost center? Is it something that costs the company money to do, or is it a revenue generator? Some of it's bringing money into the company. All these things factor into the salary range. So in order to figure out what you're worth, you have to figure out what you want to do right? And then you have to figure out what that salary range is for that role. Now you can go to certain states and get a ballpark figure because like Colorado, California, a few others require them to list salary ranges. But I'm going to tell you the best way to do this is to lean on that, that board of directors, those mentors, those sponsors. They have to have been in that field. But if you build a group of a, ne a network of people in that field, you can reach out to them and say, hey, I'm considering a job here. You know, this is the job. What do you think I'm, I should be asking for? And if you ask, you know, two, three, four people, I, I tell people it's like zeroing a weapon, right? You're going to, you're going to get that tight shot group and you're going to have the right range. And, 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 and then it's just a little negotiation back and forth on the other stuff from there. Yeah. But, but you have to do the research. My first job, I left 30 grand on the table. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. You know, I didn't know. I, I still had, I mean, they paid me great. Far, I was excited about it. And then I talked to the other directors and found out how much they were making. I was like, oh. and, it, and it never left my brain that, that, you know, that he won. Right. And I lasted a year and five days. <laughs> so, so did he win? You know, I, I yeah, but, the, but so, there's, a, but there's a lot of things that, that play into that your education, your level of responsibility. I mean, those all uh, play a part of your, uh, what you negotiate with now. Cause sometimes it's, uh, yep. yeah, I, I mean, it has to, and and then I, let's be honest. Also your role of decks, you know, how many contacts network and all that. Other stuff. Absolutely. That, that, that plays a big role in what you're doing. I mean, 
because uh, I tell people all the time that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not saying I'm the sharpest guy in the world, but because of the position I worked in, it opened up a lot of doors that maybe doesn't open up for other people. But but you got to be able to sort of, uh, like you said, let's you use those sponsors or that board of, of people that you're working with to help you sort of negotiate uh, through that uh, that gauntlet that you got there. So, you know, uh, yeah, you, do, do you find that uh, people struggle with the resume? I mean, really, uh, you know, when people ask me about resumes, I say, I always think it, you ought to make two, one military, one civilian. But but they, I think my personal feeling is they struggle with putting a good resume together to sort of tell the story about, you know, what they're doing or what their, their value is or what they want to tell their client. It, you know, it's funny. Everybody starts, everybody starts their transition with, I need to write a resume. Yeah. And I say, for what job? And yeah. they just get that deer, deer in the headlights. I'm like, it's not like, it's not your evaluations or whatever. Like this has to be tailored to a role. Like if I took my last job and just listed all my best accomplishments, that didn't, that doesn't apply to what I do now. But that's what most people do right. is, they, is they do, the, right. they do exactly right. do that. Yeah, yeah. Right. And so the first thing you have to do is figure out what you want to do. And this is the gap in the transition for a lot of people. This is why we say you start one to two years out. You need to do informational interviews with people in industry to figure out what they do every day. Like, what is your job? Like you want to, you, you want to be a, a, a non-profit, found a non-profit, you want to start a business, talk to SMA Tilly and find out what his day is like, what he focuses on, what his stresses are, what his biggest challenges have been, or me or others. You want to go into HR, find out what they spend their time on, their, their challenges, their biggest pain points, the metrics they track, stuff like this. You've kind of like in a deployment, you've got to understand the enemy to be able to go in and do the right things. It's the same thing. You've got to understand the environment you want to go into. You've got to understand the job that you want to do and then, you know, know what their pain points are, their challenges, the metrics, the big things, because once you know all that, you talk to three, four, five people in that field, it, it's easier to go into your background and find it in the military because we do all of the, like we do HR, operations, logistics, training, security, project, program management, leader development, and then all the specialties assigned, you know, to us throughout our careers. We do all those, but Nobody's hiring all of those. If I'm hiring an HR person, the extra stuff is nice, but first you have to be the best dang HR person on paper, or I had to have spoken with you and know that you are a high performer and I'm going to assume some risk on the extra stuff because I know you're going to come in and kill it. Like, yeah. That's the difference. A couple of things. One is that uh, I used to tell people you ought to have a resume. If you got 10 years in the army, you ought to have a resume now and you ought to start building on that resume all through yeah. your military career. And then you can fine tune it when you get out of the service. Yep. Uh, yeah. The second thing is, do you think that some of the employers are intimidated by uh, veterans when they come into their organization? Yeah. I mean, that's a tough question. I did have one recruiter when I was getting out say that I was intimidating. Oh, right? is that right? As, yeah. You know, yeah. As a Sergeant major, my confidence level, my ability to communicate, you know, he said it was a little intimidating. He told me afterwards. So I have heard that. I, I you know, I think one of the things that we need to understand as a, as a culture is that what is it less than 6% of the country ever served? Yeah. And so where does the 94% get their information on us? <laughs> In movies, you know, TV, newspapers, newspapers, iPhones. You know, veteran <laughs> shot 20 people. I mean, he got out, he got put out yeah. 27 years ago. No one says like dishonorable discharged veteran did yeah. it. It's just veteran, right? And I, I, I it's funny, I teach all the all the general officers and admirals in their transition course. And I say, tell me the last TV or movie that was good about the military, like really good about the military. And the admirals all go, Top Gun 2. And I said, you realize Maverick was the bad guy. Maverick had to steal jets to prove he could save the lives. You realize the admirals were willing to sacrifice all those pilots and co-pilots for the good of the nation. They weren't interested in like, and they all look at me like, I'm like, you got to understand that, that Top Gun 2 didn't, if you paid attention, didn't paint military leadership, senior leadership in a positive light. You know, and, and so they they just look at me like, I'm like, you got to understand that a large part of the country thinks that we're going to come in with PTSD. We're going to yell at people. We're yeah. going to want you to stand up. Or for the generals and admirals, I have to tell them they, they think you're going to expect a huge staff and a corner office. <laughs> and, right. And so, 
So we've got to build those relationships. We've got to talk to people so they know that we're humble and hungry. Yeah. And that um and, and that when you talk to people, I mean, like if you have a conversation with somebody SMA, within like a minute, you know if they're a high performer, you know if they're talent. And if you have room in your team, you're like, I want this guy. Yeah. Or you'll introduce them to your network. But there's also people you'll talk to and you'll be like, All right, let me give you some advice. And then you don't want to introduce them. <laughs> Because you can't put your name on the line, yeah, right? Yeah. Oh no, so I understand. Yeah, we we've gotta we've gotta as a community we've gotta focus on reaching out to veterans and our supporters and the spouses out there to build these relationships to continually grow and find our success. I mean, that's the key to all of this. Yeah, you 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 gotta. That, that's really a struggle sometimes when people get out there, again trying to fit in and and do exactly right. I was, I was thinking about something a minute ago and now I lost my thought. But there's a. There, there's so much out there for people transitioning. What what really makes me bothers me a little bit is, is one is people wait until the last second to do it. I think sometimes they're not really focused, and uh, along with their military, uh, along with their spouses and stuff. So that's that's a bother. But but the other thing is, I think we need to change the culture in the military about this entire process of transitioning. Uh, you know, somebody, somebody, I, I talked to a, a senior guy that you know, and I won't mention his name. But I talked to somebody the other day and he said, it's really funny. You know, I, I worked at a senior level in the military and I got out and nobody's really reaching out to me. Nobody's talking oh. to him, you know, within the, I mean, so they, it's like you come to the end of the road, you get off and they wave and you say goodbye, and close the door and that's it. And that's really a shame, but uh, we need to continue. You know, we need to find better ways to, you know, to get that veteran community in there with us. So yeah. and we're we're trying, but we're just not doing. And, and in fact, when I talked to recruiting command today, I said, you know, we have a recruiting issue, and I emphasize the fact about we. You know, just because mm-hmm. I'm out of the military, I'm, you know, I'm still in this fight with you. I'm just got a different uniform now. Right. Usually, it's usually cutoffs and a t-shirt or something. But uh, we got it. Hey, we're going to take another quick. This is a great discussion. I appreciate you coming on the show. A lot mm-hmm. of good information. We'll be right back. We got a lot more to talk about, so don't you go anywhere. We'll be right back. You're watching your next mission video podcast. You're watching your next mission video podcast, proudly presented by Navy Federal Credit Union, the most trusted credit union owned by members of the military community, serving all branches of the armed forces and their families. Their members are the mission. Learn more at NavyFederal.org. Purdue Global. You're ready for a comeback, and with Purdue Global, you can do more than take classes. You can take charge of your story, of your career, of your life. Earn a degree you can be proud of and get an education employer's respect. Start your comeback at purdueglobal.edu. USAA. A promise is a trust not to be broken. Whether spoken with an oath or sealed with a pinky. And after 100 years, we're still taking care of the military community and their families. That's our mission, always. Now back to your host, the 12th Sergeant Major of the Army, Jack L. Tilly. Welcome back. We're blessed to be here today with CSM retired Michael Quinn, CEO of Higher Military and Tanova LLC, and a two-time LinkedIn voice. And I want all of our viewers to reach out to directly. Tell us, you know, we're talking about transition now. Tell us about your transition. Tell them what. Tell me what things that you had a tough time with. Tell us what topics you like to cover on the show. I always tell everybody, this is not my show. This is our show. So, so tell us what you want us to cover. You can call or, or text me at 844-424-1134. And I'll, surprise on you, I'll reach back out to you. Or send me an email at smatelly at yournextmission.org. Hey, this is going to make me mad. We're heading into the final segment with you, Dan. I've, you know, Sergeant Major, I hope you enjoyed just as much as I have. And, and I want to do, uh, you know, to do, uh, get some more pro tips from my uh, transition. Mm-hmm. What would be your, your number one on your list about somebody transitioning out to, of the military? Uh, I mean, number one is start early. Yeah. It, it took me 200 phone calls to figure out what I wanted to do. You know, started off with phone calls into project management and started taking a PMP course with Onward to Opportunity. And I was like, oh, I hate this. I don't want to do it. Check. Let's take that out. Let's go into operations. I talked to a bunch of people at Amazon and other places. I'm like, nope, I don't want to do that. I, I literally worked my way through like seven, eight, nine, 10 different jobs. And then once I did figure out what I wanted to do, which is HR consulting, not HR, um, 
it, it was easier to just focus in on that and, and, and find the right opportunity. So I would say start early is number one. And, and number two is you, you've got to get outside of the military. You've got to get out and reach out and find those mentors, those sponsors you talk to, work with a lot of nonprofit organizations. You got you have to go beyond TAP. And, and I tell you that when people do put in that work and go beyond TAP, they get those additional resources. They're the ones that really stand out. Yeah. What, what's the one thing that you should absolutely do that many people don't? And, and maybe you just answer that question. Is there something that they just, you know, they should do, but they just don't do it? Uh, it you've got to ask for more. I, I mean, that's what it is. Like you, you can't, it's not just tap. Tap gets you to the one spot. You've got to, You've got to walk into the transition center and ask for more resources. You've got to walk, you know, walk into the USO and ask for more resources. You got to call mentors and say, what did you use? Mentors that are out already. Like, what do you recommend? Or who could you introduce me to? You've got to, you've got to have this. I think I said earlier, like a humble hunger to learn more. You've got to, you've got to have that humility that you're not this anymore you know, that you're not your rank, you're not your position anymore when you're out. So you've got to go in and say, hey, what do I need to learn? What do I need to do? What do I need to grow to make myself a best candidate? And then, you know, you've got to have the hunger to just like, hey, I know I need a job at this time. I need a network this time. I'm just going to just make it happen. And that's why if you start two years out, you can space these calls out. You can space the research out. You can start everything far enough out. Um, but if you wait until six months, you know, you're you're going to be in a hard place. It's hard to fit in all those phone calls and do all the VA stuff and everything else while you still have a job if you do it in the last six months. Yeah, no, you're right. Hey, one of the things you said a little while ago, and I, I, forgot, I forgot what I wanted to say, but I'm going to go back to it. I think we need to have a like a national TV show that talks about what our veterans and community do uh, does uh, when the military, you know, veterans and active duty service member. But, but somehow we have to educate middle America about what we're doing so they have a better understanding. The other thing I'll say is that uh, when we talk about education, you know, usually officers come in, we don't get too much of an officer, but they cut a degree or some sort. Well, that's not true no more of the listed corps. A lot of the listed corps non-commissioned officers have, a, you know, associates, ambassadors, a master's, or a doctorate in a lot of areas. So, you know, the education level as far as uh, in the military now is a lot better than a lot of people do. The other thing is that we was talking about companies a minute ago. I always used to do that. If I was going to go talk to somebody, I'd get online and research that company. And when I researched the company, I'd find out what uh, officer or non-commissioned officer worked in that company and what level they was at. You know, because I wanted to know who I was going to talk to. And I'd look at their mission and their objectives and all that stuff. So, I'd, you know, I sort of got in my mind, hey, look, I know what the key word is. Uh, you know, so I, I, our key words are, but... Uh, yeah, I think that's good. This smart for you to do that. Yeah. Hey, we we already talked about we talked about mentors and and sponsorship. Is there anything we missed on that? I mean, that, that's such an important subject for all of. And I got to tell you that when I did that, I think I had probably uh, four or five, even while I was in the army. Because yeah. let's be honest, a sergeant major army, there's not a whole lot of people that you can talk to. Uh, really, I, I, because the yeah, chief, I agree. Yeah, yeah, the chief's gone all the time. Uh, you got an, maybe a device or somebody like that. But you got to find somebody that you can talk to. I always talk to my wife about stuff. But but I also found some non-commissioned officers and some some guys that I got out of the service that were veterans to reach mm -hmm. out to. And uh, that's why I always think that uh, mentors or sponsors, however you want to call it, are so, so important. Anything you missed that you want to add on that? I think, yeah. Again, it's so important. No, I mean, I, I think that's a big, so a couple of things. I want to, with the finding the mentors and sponsors piece, and then also with, you know, the military not reaching out after you got, you've got you gotten out. That's why I'm so big on LinkedIn is, you know, I was able to build a community while I was still in that stayed with me when I was out. And and when I post, people in and out see it. So it's like I'm checking in and, and it's the, the same way. So I never felt like I lost my community. So that's one thing. Number two, I, I really believe, you know, the VA has this new program. They started about a year, year and a half ago, I think, called Solid Start, where they call transition service members, you know, veterans, recent veterans every like three, six months or whatever to check on them. I, I really think that military leaders should be calendarizing check-in calls for their direct reports. Like if you rated them, they got out from that assignment, put it on a calendar, just give them a call in three months or six months and say, hey, are, are you okay? How's it going? You know, those calls can can change or save a life. Um, 
And then, you know, the other thing I'll say is, you know, you mentioned doing research on on companies. I I think people leave out the doing research on people as well. So if you're gonna if you're gonna hop on a call with someone, you're going on an interview or whatever, you could do some light stalking on the internet and and find things that you have in common with someone and and bring it up in the conversation in in a in a, in a kind of comfortable nonchalant way or in the opening re, re, outreach message and and that instantly creates some kind of a of a bond that makes it easier for them to talk to you that makes you you have something in common it builds a relationship you know in a way that's levels beyond you'd have just with that initial call like oh my god you love the eagles too you know oh yeah i'm an eagles fan so you know if some if i'm on a call with someone when they start talking about the eagles it's a different conversation already <laughs> and, and, you know cuz I, they would know I'm a passionate Eagles fan, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. And I already love them. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'll, I'll pop them a question and say, is it Pats or Geno's just to check if they know Philly yeah. or if they're lying. And if they don't say, if they say either one of them, I'll say, you know, all right, you're lying to me. You know, even then that's <laughs> fine. But, but, you know, you find these things in common, like the veteran yeah. community, like, hey, you're a veteran, I'm a veteran. Like that could be a way to open the door, but you said how many, 16, 17 million veterans? Yeah. So sometimes you just have to look at next, a little layer, a little layer down, and find you know something in common. Hey, you were in this unit. Hey, you were this rank. Hey, you like this thing. I saw a picture of you, you know, skiing or whatever. But if you can find those little tidbits that really tie us together as human beings, that's when the relationships start to form. Well, that's that's really what I meant when I said research the company. I was really talking about research the company, research the people, because and I'm really lucky because a lot of people know me and I don't know them. Uh, yeah. Just just because of the office right. I had there, yeah, yeah. So that that makes it really good. Uh, you know, you you mentioned how you can turn. We talk about mentors and sponsors, but you, yeah. I guess we can turn mentors into sponsors. That's really what you want yeah. to do, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that's yeah. Yes. Can I can I talk to that? Yeah, that, absolutely. That okay? No, no. Go ahead. I just uh, I, yeah. So so I, you know, I, I get a lot of requests for calls, and and I know you do as well. A lot of mentorship, a lot of people asking questions about the transition and everything. I, and I do as much as I can. But every initial call, like if I take a call, if I have an exchange whatsoever, I give them something to do. That's not like a, hey, hit this button once. Like it takes a little bit of work. And I do that to see if they're going to be willing to put in the effort. Like, are they going to follow my advice? Do they value my advice? Are they going to put in the work or were they just looking for the easy button? And I'll tell you, like, probably 85% don't do it. You know, I, I tell you, look, here, hey, call the, you know, reach out to these three types of people, talk to five people in this career field, then come back to me. And, and at that point, I'll open my network to you, right? If you went out and followed through it. So, so when we talk about turning mentors into sponsors, I, I have like my technique for that. And the first thing is, you know, you, you've got to turn into mentor. It's engagement, it's communication, but you've got to say thank you. You know, intrusive leadership is not a thing out here, right? It's it's in some places illegal. And so, you know, um, you, you've got to build a relationship. You've got to say thank you repeatedly. I tell people thank you notes for some reason they're they're out of style and I don't know why. You know, it takes you, you know, a minute or two minutes to, hey, SMA, thank you so much for spending time with me. You know, I really appreciate your insight. You know, that, that and that just shows that you have, you know, the EQ that you're that you're someone that cares. But here's the big one: if you're on a call with someone, if someone's giving you advice and you want them to be a mentor or a sponsor, you've got to do the advice. Like if I if I want you to be a mentor to me, SMA, and you say, "Hey, Mike, look, I really want you to read this book," I need to read that book. If I don't read that book. <laughs> I didn't value your advice, right? Yeah. But if I read that book and I come back to you in two weeks and say, hey, SMA, like I read the book. It was amazing. I got these three major points in it. Like, you, that's it. Like, you're going to be like, hey, he listens. He values my advice. He follows through. He sends me notes. Like, then it's 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 off to the races. And so I have these conversations with people where I give them something to do. And I have, I have 350,000 followers on LinkedIn. I can I can reach out to CEOs of major corporations or C-suite leaders and make direct connections. And I do it for the people that show that they're going to follow through, right? If I tell you to do something, you need to do it and come back to me. I don't have ESP. 
I can't read your mind. And I think that in some ways, we have a culture when we're in senior leaders, especially that we don't feel comfortable going back out and asking for help or or following up or whatever. And, and it's something we need to realize because, you know, you, me, Ted, anybody would 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 do whatever we can for someone that shows that they're going to put in the work, that they're earnest, they're humble, and they're hungry. And, and and I'll introduce people like that to my network all day. And they and they want to talk to them because a high performer is worth up to 400 percent more than a standard employee, like four times more production. And that's what we got to get to. And there's so many of those in our community, but it starts with finding the mentors, building the relationships, showing you're going to follow through. And that, and then the sponsorship takes place. Yeah. You, you know, you hit something there a minute ago. You got 330,000 followers on LinkedIn. I guess you're the big dog on this because I just, I think we got 12,000 or something, <laughs> but, but we're building up. <laughs> yeah. Hey, we're getting, we're getting stronger. Hey, and you think, do you really think that, uh, you know, that, People realize how much how much work they got to put in to really, you know, make their transition successful. I think a lot of people don't realize how tough it can be, and they sort of, you know, maybe blow it off a little bit and say, "I'll work through it," you know, maybe later. I, I think a lot of people get scared, right? I think, especially senior leaders that have been doing it their whole life, like they go to tap. You know, you're supposed to start it one year out. You get this list of stuff, and you realize that, hey. I need to choose a career, make a choice, apply for jobs. And I, I think a lot of senior leaders get scared. Like, like, I don't, I don't know how to do this. There's no SOP. There's no like right way to do it. And so what they do is they just kind of like compartmentalize it, chuck it over here and say, I got to do mission. I got to do mission until they get to the end. And then they're struggling because they focused on everybody else and they didn't take care of themselves. And then the other piece is, there's a culture in some places where people are kind of scared to say that they're getting out. Like I had a, one of the most senior leaders in the military got on LinkedIn and said, I'm on LinkedIn, but you know, I'm not, doesn't mean I'm retired on active duty. I'm just <laughs> here because I, I'm going to work to the end. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, you didn't have to say that. No. Like you set the wrong standard. When you say that you're, you're making excuses for taking care of yourself instead of, you know, doing what's necessary to get yourself right for your next career, but you can still do that and do your job. Yeah. So. I think the other thing is you never think the end is coming. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, yeah, I'm a year out. But that year is going to, that year goes by fast, you know, yeah. or two years go yeah. by fast, but you really never, you never think it's coming. It's, go back to me again. I think about my transition is, is uh, what it was. It was uh, like, uh, Four days before I left DC, I was in the Pentagon working out an issue, and yeah. which, but but you know I, I didn't mind doing that, but uh, you know it was important. It said some sergeant major, that, you know the new guys coming in, mm -hmm. you know you ought to, you worked it before, so I said yeah, let me go. But it was but yeah. it was about giving money to soldiers, uh, yep. and making sure they didn't take money back from. So I thought that was really important. So hey, first of all, let me say up front here. Uh, what a joy it is to talk to you. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you're a guy that's got a big heart and cares so much about. Uh, our service members and their families. And I appreciate uh, what you do and appreciate your friendship and, and what you can do to do. And just know that uh, we're here to, we're here to help you in any way we can. Any final yeah. thoughts, anything that you maybe want to touch on that maybe we didn't touch on during the conversation? Yeah, I have two. One is, are you happy SMA? Like with where your career has gone, with what you do every day, the impact you're having on lives? Yes. Uh, yeah, right. that's 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 a well. Let me answer it real quick. The answer is yes, and 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 I tell I tell Ted and all these guys, all, I've been blessed in life. Uh, I love my wife. I had a great marriage and grandkids, kids, and all this other stuff. But but I've been really blessed with working in the business environment for a long time. And now we have the foundation. We got the, you know the your next mission podcast, which you're on right now. So I'm really blessed. I don't. Here's, I'm not bragging. Anybody that's listening, I'm bragging. I don't have a bill. Everything I have is paid off. So I'm in a good. I'm in a good spot in my life. So the answer to your question is yes. The one thing I'm not happy about is because my wife just had a back operation. Is I wish I could travel a little bit more. And, and because yep. you know, because she's not feeling well, we're not going to travel too much. But I need to travel a little bit more. But other than that, you know, life's been good to me. Uh, it, it, you know, the army was good to me. Life is good to me. My kids are good to me. Everything's good. So I'm happy. And I think that's important for a lot of our community to understand is that you could be as happy or happier mm -hmm. in your next career. Yeah. It doesn't 
devalue what we did in the military. It's just a different part of our life. And and even if you serve 20 to 30 years, it's still only a fraction of your life and your adult life. And so I, I, I do want people to know that if they put in the work and they build the relationships, they can find happiness on the other side that is equal to what they had while serving, but different, but equal. Um, so the other thing I'll say is that I'm looking forward to AUSA, the annual meeting. Oh, uh, you and me both. That I'm going to be at AOC and, and, and me and a couple members of my team with uh, are going to be with your team down on the exhibit floor uh, with a whole bunch of other incredible companies that are uh, going to be there to provide support. Yeah, I mean, like you can come right in and get just about based on the companies I know that are signed up in your section. Uh, you can come right in and get like everything you need to get like a launch pad for your next career. And uh, we're not going to say we know you're getting out. You know, we're going to sit down there and help you uh, right there on the spot. So I'm I'm super excited uh, and really looking forward to that next month. Well, what you should say is you, you can get excited about your next mission. <laughs> that's what, yeah. Hey, thanks. That's a, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, the, the guy that's good at branding, you know, you can't substitute that for experience and uh, wisdom. No, no. That, so I, you, I, I, wish just, I, I wish I'd come I up it. with that. <laughs> I wish I could. Someone else, somebody else, come up with that. But I'm, yeah. I'm going to use it. Use it to the end. Hey, thank you. God bless you and your family. God bless you, all the things you're doing, and and keep up the good work. And always remember, we're, uh, we're here for you. We'll do anything we can to help you out. Thank you. Thanks again, though, for Michael. For uh, I shouldn't say Michael. Thanks again for Sergeant Major being on the show. I'm not going to say Michael. I don't care what anybody says. Thanks a lot for Sergeant Major being on the show with us today. I'm Jack Tilly, 12th Sergeant Major of the Army. You've been watching your next mission video podcast. And thank you for joining us. Please visit our website at yournextmission.org and leave me a review. I, this has got to be a good review, but I can take a bad one. But, but tell me what you, you know, tell me what you want me to talk about. Uh, tell me what you want me to discuss on this show. Cause it's your show, not my show. You can also visit our nonprofit and corporate partners where you can see all the jobs and services that are available that will assist you in your transition from the military. Please know, we want to assist you any way we can. I'm going to say that again, just like Sergeant Major was talking about. Please know we, all of us, want to assist you any way we can. Please follow me on all my personal social media pages, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Rumble. And I'm getting tongue-tied there a little bit. But, you know, when I, I get tongue-tied because uh, Sergeant Major said he had 330,000 followers and it's just sort of rattled me a little bit now. And if you enjoyed the discussion with uh, Sergeant Major, like us, click on that subscribe button below. Also, don't forget to click on the bell next to the subscribe button to receive notifications about, you know, all of our upcoming video podcasts. Don't forget, we want to hear from you. Please leave me a message or send me a text at 844-424-1134. Send me an email at smatilly at yournextmission.org. Again, thanks again to Sergeant Major uh, Quinn for joining us today. It was just great having him on the show. And and, 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 you know, I always get closing comments right here at the end, but remember, transition is a, is a team sport. It's about you and your spouse. It's about making sure you start at the right time. We talked about two years out. It's about networking. It's about making sure you do have a resume. It's also very important to have a sponsor, somebody that assists you in that process of, of getting out of service. The one thing that you don't want to do is get out, go home, and sit on the couch and don't do anything. You know, I tell people all the time, we are part of a family. I don't care if you're a private or a general. We all have the same kind of issues and, and concerns for each other. Uh, again, you're all part of a family. The only difference is I'm not going to give you any money, but you're still part of my family. Again, thanks for watching. Thanks to New Mind Studios and, of course, our presenting sponsors, Navy Federal Credit Union, Purdue Global, and USAA. We appreciate all you do for our military. And as always, see you, all of you, on the high ground. hoo -ah! You've been listening to Your Next Mission, brought to you by the American Freedom Foundation. Learn more by visiting yournextmission.org.